All right, so let's get started. As always, my intro is up on the screen. All right, so this is me, and uh, some of you know me as this, and this, and this, and this, but lately things have gotten a little bit crazy for me. See, I uh, quit my job, yeah, sold all my stuff, packed up my wife and four kids, and moved from here to here which looks real nice on that little map, but that is just insane. That's 21 and a half hours in the air to be with you people. So. All right, now some of you might be asking, you know, uh, Uganda, <laughs> what's up with that? Well, don't, don't be so harsh on Uganda. I mean, they've got rules just like anywhere else. It says, do not urinate here, fine of 50,000. Uh, I can still get breakfast out, and I can still get lunch in drive through and I can even go to a drive through chicken place if I'm interested. <laughs> We've got a cozy little place in the country with a shiny but prickly red gate where a man named Joseph looks after things for us. <laughs> we lost our minivan but gained a sturdy truck. We also gained a few pets. This is Fred. And this was Tony, he had a posse. <laughs> we got a cat to deal with a posse though. This is, this is Africa though, you know? This is like the circle of life, right? So what eats cats? That's what we got to deal with next. <laughs> but we, uh, we do have a Best Buy. <laughs> and we have a Safeway. And a Walmart. And a Target and a mall. <laughs> we have all the modern conveniences. I mean, our place is so great, even my kids' stuffed animals have net access. <laughs> all right, that one was pushing it. Now, we really do have internet access, though. It, it, there's an equation to it. Uh, you actually add this plus this plus this uh, to get something that looks like this. <laughs> to get something that looks like this. <laughs> YouTube's awesome at 10K. <laughs> this is all the downloads you'll ever need anyway, especially if you live in the 70s. Well, we, we have very nice neighbors. Here's our neighbors. Uh, they're really sweet. Uh, and the country's great, but unlike any other place, it has its share of problems. Our problems are just a little more dangerous than others. <laughs> All right, so this begs some very obvious questions. Uh, this is probably the first one. And uh, that, that question is pretty valid. I mean, after all, I've achieved some level of success in this industry as an author and a, a media personality and a public speaker. I had a dream job and a wonderful family, and I had it made. Uh, and of course, now I'm unemployed and living off of donations, and most importantly, pretty happy. See, I had lots of stuff. I had the fame and the cool job and the free beer and the rock star friends, but even with all of this stuff, I was pretty miserable. The good thing is I figured out what my problem was. My problem was I didn't feel like my life counted for a whole lot. In fact, I didn't feel like I was making much of a difference at all, whether in life or in this industry or whatever. And my goal today is to save you from that fate and give you some advice. So that's the, that's the point of this talk. Now, to explain, explain how this all happened properly, I've got to tell you my life story. And parts of it are going to be embarrassing. <laughs> so I was a pretty innocent kid, and that was the only time I ever wore lederhosen, I swear. <laughs> but underneath that gentle exterior, there lurked a dark side. <laughs> and uh, my fascination with computers started here with the TRS-80. I didn't, in fact, own one of these. I actually borrowed it. It was in the mall. You know, they'd have these things out and you could use them. And what I would do is I would go to the library and get basic programming books and write basic programs on a pad of paper, take it to the mall, try them out. If it didn't work, I'd, I'd use my eraser, <laughs> you know, it, very complex debugger. <laughs> I upgraded to the TI, which is the Bill Cosby computer, and took backyard programming lessons under a tree with my black and white TV took programming lessons. And this was an interesting time. This was when computers were like magic. I don't know if any of you remember that time. It was like when, when you knew how to code. 
right? When, when you understood how these things worked, you were special. You know, you talked a different language. This was, this was a very cool time. Well, I got an upgrade. My upgrade path went from this to this, the Commodore 64. <laughs> and of course, it came with a modem, which is running at about the same speed I'm running at now. So some <laughs> things don't change. But the, the modem actually opened a lot of doors for me. <laughs> no pun intended. Um, I found BBSs, you know, bulletin board systems, and I found this community of people who were just like me, and even though I couldn't put my finger on what exactly that was, bulletin boards defined that for me. These people were hackers. They were brilliant, mischievous, but open. And the things that they did were a little bit different. They thought outside the box, pushed the envelope of technology, and solved difficult problems elegantly. This was a really interesting group. So I took the information that I found there and you know, tinkered and experimented and learned. I just took everything in. And before long, this became my identity. This was my first identity. And it didn't exactly gel with my conservative Christian upbringing, but nonetheless, I was a hacker. That's how I was wired. So even though at 12 I looked like this, I had a dream that one day I would look something like this and I would be a spy or something, and I would, I would creep around my neighborhood at night with Legos made into spy gear, like some cyber ninja, you know, hunting my digital prey. Uh, but in reality, I was just, you know, an average guy. Uh, I did no homework. I aced all my tests. That gave me a solid C average. Everything about me was average. Well, my dad brought home a 386, and I learned Windows and Linux. I ripped that machine apart so many times I lost count so I could learn how, to hard, how the hardware worked. I did the same with the software. Took the black and white TV that was in my basement and jacked up the band so high that I was in the 900 megahertz range listening to cell conversations. I said, you could do that back then. Took a scanner, and this is all with information that I got online from the community. I took a scanner and wired a digital out to it so that I could hook it into my sound card so I could pull down pager information. Poxag and Flex, some of you might remember that stuff. I was looking at people's pager data. One time I got, a, I got an interesting page and I checked out the IP address and it routed back to none other than the White House. And I realized I was getting the sysadmins pages that worked at the White House and I knew when the firewall went down. <laughs> now how I know that it failed open is a different story. I'll leave that alone. But like these socks that I saw one time, there were no boundaries to the knowledge that I could gain in this community. It was just, it was unbelievable. In fact, I learned so much from the hacking community that I eventually dropped out of college because the crap they were trying to feed me was utterly ridiculous. They wanted me to learn RPG and COBOL. Anybody that remembers those hideous languages will start twitching. It was evil. And I said, why do I have to learn this crap? And they said, well, it's for writing business reports. And I said, well, I know Fortran and C. I could write your stupid business reports in that. And of course, they didn't want to hear that because, of course, they were the RPG and COBOL teachers. <laughs> and that would just make them not matter. So I dropped out of college and I ended up getting my dream job with CSC. And they made little pictures like this for their newsletter and quotes like this, which made me realize that I had, in fact, achieved my dream. That I got paid to break into buildings, to break past network security, to do all the cool stuff that I used to make up when I was 12 years old. And pictures like this were pretty common. This was us. This was our team. This was Strikeforce. We did, uh, we did assessments against the government. We did commercial assessments. We did physical stuff, getting past guards. I mean, this was incredibly sexy work. This was, this was great work. So the dream had come true. This, this picture did end up being me, and the super cyber ninja stuff that I dreamed about when I was 12 was absolutely real. But it wasn't enough. I wanted more. And as you can tell from this picture, if you look very closely at the t-shirt, you can tell what I was thinking. See, even though I had this dream job with Strikeforce, to me, I wanted more. I wanted fame. I wanted recognition. And the way that you got that back in the late 80s was you got an article published in Frack and you spoke at DEF CON. Once you did those two things, you made it. So in 1998, I posted my first FRAC article under a pseudonym, little thing on steganography, 
And then a few years later, in 2003, I got my first speaking slot at DEF CON 11. The talk was called Watching the Watchers. How many people saw that? Show of hands, I'm really sorry. <laughs> See, the reason I'm sorry is that I knew the famous guys, the famous guys back in the day that had that certain something that was a little bit different on stage and in the way that they presented themselves, right? These guys had, you know, a certain flair. And I tried to emulate them. I took little pieces of each one of the people, and not all of them are listed here, but I took a little piece of each one of them and I tried to be that. Now imagine, I, I don't have the graphics capability to do this properly, but imagine morphing all of these people into one person. <laughs> yeah. No offense to any of them individually, but that's pretty hideous. <laughs> and that's what my 2003 presentation was. It was absolutely hideous because it wasn't me. In fact, the presentation sucked. And this phase of my life was all about me trying to be someone else, but it was me focused on me, me trying to be something. So I got back from, from DEF CON in 2003 and I was absolutely desperate, see, because I had gotten to the top of my career, I had achieved my dreams, I had validated everything that I stood for by speaking at DEF CON and being published in FRAC. I, had the top of the, I got to the top of the ladder and I realized the view sucked. I didn't get invited to any parties, you know. I didn't have any groupies. Well, I had one, but it was a homeless guy that wasn't actually supposed to be at the conference, and I wanted him to go, <laughs> to go away. But I don't know what it was. Maybe it was desperation, uh, but I fell back on my Christian upbringing and turned my life over to Christ. And some of you remember this. I posted on my website that I am a Christian. Now, this was rather significant because to me, this was suicide. This was me turning my back on my career and saying, I'll do shrubbery, I don't care. I haven't found fulfillment in my job. This sucks, I've done it on my own long enough, I'm done. And my prayer was pretty simple, I remember it clearly, it was do something with my life. And I like to think that God answered that prayer because three weeks later, Singerus came to me and said, we saw that talk you did, would you be interested in writing a book on Google hacking? <laughs> it took me six months to decide to write it and three months to actually write it, and it absolutely took off. Now, this wasn't anything I invented. This wasn't stuff that I came up with. This was other people's stuff. In fact, a lot of the book had queries in it from other people on the web that had submitted them. You know, and I give attribution to that and everything, but the point is, this was the community. This was knowledge from the community. But this was an absolute gift. That was the first book. The second book, uh, Grifter came to me and said, hey, you want to help me out with my book? That was the second book. And then Aaron came to me and said, hey, you want to help me out with my book? That was my third book. And then Bruce, you remember Bruce from the slides back there, said, I'm working on this book. You want to help me with this book? And then I pulled together some experts and then wrote this book. And then came the Rockstar series. <laughs> Singris asked me to write on stealing, which was where all the rock stars were. And I was like, holy crap. <laughs> I mean, these were guys that I looked up to and it was really intimidating to be involved in that. But this was absolutely overkill. I mean, this was like a rocket ride. It turned into this, dozen book projects, a landslide of press appearances all over the place, and my life blew up 100%. This was an interesting time for me. Uh, I'm not even gonna get into all the celebrity sightings. Yes, that's Vanilla Ice and Jenny McCarthy and Paris Hilton. These were weird times. But life was good, you know? I was back at the peak. But the simple fact was I was on the peak again and I was miserable. See, somewhere in the madness I lost touch and I fell into the same exact trap that I fell into in 2003. My focus had shifted back to me. It's the title of this talk, Me to We. My focus was on me again. And some really bad things happened uh, in my life during this time. I had been given this crazy forum on my website that went from 500 users to like 80,000 users in like three months. It just exploded. And there was one guy that was on the forum um, who was named Argod. How many people show of hands remember Argod? A few of you, okay. Well, the, what, what happened was I stopped visiting my own forums because I was busy writing books. Not good books like the ones that I listed there, but crappy books just so I could get my name on more books. Focused on me again. And Argod, who was my number one poster, 
disappeared. He vanished. And I found out like a year later that he died. And that this was a kid who for the last months of his life was confined to a wheelchair in his room, cranking out PHP exploits at the tune of like three a day, posting them on my site. And he was like one of the first guys that posted Google dorks on his exploits, on his web exploits. So here's the exploit and here's how you find targets on Google. He was like the guy that started that. I had a guy die on my watch, on my forums, and I didn't even know. And he was busy boosting my presence in the industry. That was, that was tough for me, and it got me, got me thinking. That was, that was our God. So it was, a, it was a bad time, but my focus was about to change. And that happened when my wife, Jen, went to Uganda for the first time. And some of you remember this, this piece of the story. She went to Uganda. She brought back pictures like this. This is Colin. And she showed me this picture, and every single picture she showed me of Colin, he was smiling, that big, goofy smile, and he's completely butt naked, which is why I take the shot that way. <laughs> and he's butt naked because he doesn't, like, own any clothes. His parents are both dead, one from malaria, one from AIDS. He lives with his grandmother in a pretty little house like this. This is Colin. And she shot video of this kid dancing and jumping and singing. He was the happiest kid in the world, and he had nothing. And I had everything, and I was miserable. And I didn't know what was up with that. So I said, I, I figured, I got to go to Uganda and see what is up with this. Because <laughs> he's got something that I don't. It's expensive. And the way that you do these kind of mission trips is you tell people you're going, and they help you. Well, all of my friends were online. <laughs> I didn't have, like, any, you know, IRL friends. <laughs> my, mine, were, mine were all digital. So I sent some emails, and it got blogged. And hackers paid for our mission trip to Uganda, Africa. Some of you remember this. Well, the folks in Uganda that we worked with, that was AOET, they found out I was a computer guy, and they're like, you're going to do computer stuff. <laughs> I'm like, rock on. So we cleaned up some computers and put together a little computer lab, and I took a handful of wireless cards, and I pulled their office together into a wireless network, and I was proud of this picture, Google loading wirelessly in their office in the middle of nowhere, Uganda, because of us. That was awesome. <laughs> but it caught me off guard towards the end of the trip because they showed me what this did. And what this did is this basically reopened this office. This office had sort of crawled to a halt because they were processing kids that had lost their parents and they were trying to find profiles and sponsors for them, sponsors to pay for their schooling and all that stuff. And their network, their computers were so screwed up that they had to like stop. And now, kids were streaming into their office and getting food, education, medical care. My work in Uganda had immediate life-changing results right away. Now, when I got back to my dream job, and I sat down at my desk, and I looked for the give me immediate fulfilling results button on my computer, I found it to be missing. <laughs> Because in all my career, I had never felt anything like that. It was an amazing feeling to save someone's life 10 or 20 or 100 times over. And I found it to be a little bit addictive. And I started thinking, well, if I can do this and I'm one person, maybe a lot of people could do a lot of stuff. And that's where Hackers for Charity came from. Uh, and, but I thought to myself, this can't possibly work. Who's going to be interested in this? This is hackers and this is like Africa and poor kids. Uh, but I gave it a shot. And... One of our first projects that we posted was for AOET, and uh, I had this spec'd out. I had this job spec'd out recently. What they needed was a sponsorship site like this. People online could click on the little picture. You've probably seen stuff like this. Job specs out at like $50,000, six people, six months. So Paul Madoff, our first volunteer, coded this in like a week, <laughs> like a case of Red Bull or something for free. <laughs> Cranked this out. Result, 61 children sponsored. That means 61 children have somebody in the U.S. paying for their education, their medical care, everything for an entire year. 61 kids. So I had the bug. I wrote No Tech Hacking, put this little stamp on the front, decided to donate all my proceeds to this program. And when I said to AOET, I want to give you money from my book, where should it go? They said, send the money to Kenya because kids are starving. So let me show I, this is I know this is like sort of infomercial ish, but let me let me show you this video of our food program. 
My name is Abel Lucho. Abel yeah. Lucho. Yes. Ah, okay. And what grade are you in? Standard. I'm in Standard 7. It's in Cape Primary School. Ah, okay. Yeah. So, um, you live here alone? Yes. By yourself? Mm. I live here alone. And your no parents? Bad. Your parents? Your mom, your dad? They all died. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. And you built this home? You built this? They're the one who built it. Yes, mm. built it alone without mm. anybody. No one helped? Yeah. Oh, it's good. <laughs> you did a good job on it. But it has some problems, yeah? The house is too small for the boy. He has a table that somebody donated to him. Has no chair. Whenever the rains rain, this house is actually flooded. You can see on the sides of this wall, it is damp right now, and it is a dry season. When was the last time it rained? Um, three weeks ago. Yeah. It rained three weeks ago, so and this it is, is from still three weeks. it is still damp. So you're working Friday, Saturday, Sunday, sometimes. Yes, to Sunday. get food. Mm. He works food to and get food. Um, tuition money in the schools. So tuition money. Yes. If you had someone providing food. If somebody gave you food. You could work less. Yes, I can work well. Work less. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you told me you want to be a lawyer, a judge. Yes. Yeah, study law. Yeah. I prefer to study law. Mm. That's a lot of schooling. <laughs> You'll be in school for a long time. That's okay? Yeah. You enjoy school? Yes. Yeah? Good. I always enjoy We invited Abel to the Hackers for Charity food drive, and the next day he showed up. We provided him with 16 kilograms of maize and a pound of cooking fat. We also provided him with seeds and garden space so that he can grow his own vegetables. The maize and cooking fat will last a month, but the garden will most likely last for years. The culture is extremely reserved, but when we presented him with a t-shirt from Kingpin Enterprises, he was all smiles. Abel will be entered into the online AOET sponsorship system, which was designed by Hackers for Charity volunteer Paul Madoff. He'll eventually find a sponsor to assist him with his food, health care, and school fees. But until that time comes, Hackers for Charity will continue to stand in the gap for Abel and the other thousands of children we currently support through our food program. All right, so this thing, is, this thing is incredibly cool, it's incredibly powerful, but it was off-centered just a little bit for me because um, this wasn't computers, and being the computer geek that I am at heart, <laughs> I still have a passion for technology. So I said that to AOET, I'm like, well, what do you need? I'm like a computer guy, and they said, training labs. We need computer training labs because it's about education, it's about empowerment. Um, so we started building them computer labs. Some of them was we used donated equipment. Sometimes we would we would take the funds that we rose and we would, you know that we raised and we would buy new equipment. So here's uh, here's just a quick look at what our classroom program does. This is part of the, the computer class uh, from the funding that we got from Hackers for Charity. We were able to buy ten computers. This December program is really a program to excite the younger people about computer training and stuff. And many of them have left school, they don't have the skill, so we hope that when they get interested in computer training, we'll be able to equip them better. Right, so an interesting thing has started to happen though, and this thing has started to get really personal. Uh, now that I'm living in Uganda, I'm actually meeting some of these people, and I want to take a second to introduce you to Fred. Now, now, Fred does not own a computer. He's a Ugandan. What he does is he repairs laptops. He figured this out on his own, like how to repair laptops, and he repairs the laptops so that he can get time using them after he repairs them. That's the deal, all right? And at the end of this interview, I asked him about hackers. Uh, check this out. This is pretty interesting. I feel like I have, I'm part of these machines, <laughs> these technology things, but uh, the limitation still stands. 
Uh, I'm praying that I may have access to them. And uh, I interrupt with this machine so that uh, I think that will be my life all day. <laughs> See, when I wake up in the morning and start working with the computer, if I'm in a room where there is power and there is the machine, then I don't feel like eating. <laughs> I don't feel like eating. Yeah, up to night, late night, that's when I feel like sleeping. I can do best at night because <laughs> I have nothing that interrupts me and uh, I'm free. <laughs> I've been hearing of Hakai Sakes, but uh, if I happen to be one, at least in Uganda, I'd do better. Yeah. So part of the idea is, I, you know, these classroom things are great, but you know, I love the idea of empowerment. You know, I want to, I want to collect two hundred dollars, buy this kid a netbook and a case of Red Bull. <laughs> You know what I mean? I, and, and I have the capability to make that thing happen. Uh, when I was in Uganda, uh, one of my trips, I met the Minister of Energy. He came to meet me. This is the President's right-hand man. This is like the Vice President of this country. Came to me and said, I want to build some computer classrooms. I've given some money to people and they squandered it and it made me look bad. Can you build me a computer classroom? I've never had the Vice President of this country come to me and ask me for help. <laughs> let alone a hacker, right? So this thing's scaling up really fast. It's going to take time, and it's going to take money, and it's going to take manpower. Well, I got the time thing straightened out because I quit my job to focus on this. So the time shouldn't be a problem. Uh, living off of support from this community, some of the people in this room are paying for my family's existence in Uganda, which I think is pretty amazing. Money, we have a couple different things going on. You've seen the t-shirts for sale. That goes to support this work. The donor cloud, you get a link on our website. That goes to support our work. And the Informer, which I'm going to talk a little bit more about at the end, is a subscription service to give you access to cool stuff, industry cool stuff before anybody else does. That's what we're trying to do for money. And then the manpower is the last thing. Manpower is us. Thank you. Do I have five minutes from now? Yeah. Uh, you have uh, 13 minutes. Excellent. We're good. The manpower part of this equation is us. It's this community. See, we have an amazing community, and I am a product of this community. The knowledge that I gained from this community, from reading the stuff that's out there and interacting with you people at DEF CON made me who I am today, literally, which is why I'm a hacking community advocate <laughs> at this point. And I'm pretty proud of that role because we, we just kick complete ass. <laughs> And if you don't believe me when I say that, um, you haven't heard about the PayPal incident. See, a few weeks ago, uh, I sort of screwed up, and all of our funds are in, are in PayPal, and I needed to flip to a business account so we could have a fancier shopping cart. So I flipped it, and I checked the little box that said I'm a 501c3, which technically we are because we've filed, but I don't have the stuff back from the IRS. And then as I got into the PayPal process, they're like, send us the stuff from the IRS. And I'm like, oops, can I go back? And they're like, no, no, your funds are frozen. And I'm in Uganda living off that account. So I got all pissed off and like Twittered it. I was like, PayPal freaking shut us down. Six hours later, PayPal unlocked us and started sending emails saying, can you tell your people to stop? <laughs> I'm hearing rumors of phone switches and fax servers exploding. <laughs> and the answer was, no, I cannot tell my people to stop. And for those of you who are into charts, I have some charts to prove that our community rocks. See, this little, this little thing shows, me, shows you how many children we've fed over time. The little blips on the, the left there are me trying to do this with Informer. Buy Informer subscriptions, woo! Okay, well then in April, <laughs> things start to improve, right? Well, April 22nd, Simple Nomad starts contributing. April 30th, Roloff releases a Multigo Super License. May 9th, we get an O-Day release through Informer. May 30th, the Backtrack team says, we're going to release Backtrack 4 through Informer and look at the numbers. The community did this. The community fed thousands of children 
by giving us a little bit of content and you people bought subscriptions. And the thing that's cool about this is that these were people from all walks of life, all religions. I'm a Christian. I'm not going to point them out. But we've got a Jew. We've got a Wiccan an atheist on this list. And that doesn't matter because the end result is exactly the same. And I don't know about you. I think this is cool. But I never in a million years expected this. What happened to my sound? Give me sound. This is mine. You're to, welcome. I have to play it again now that we have sound. Check this out. Thank you, Father. Come again. Come again. I'm the sister's mom. I'm the sister's mom. You're welcome. Thank you. So thousands of miles away on the other side of the world, these are the parents of the kids that we're feeding, the families that we're, fe that we're feeding, saying, thank you, hackers. I think it's the first time ever <laughs> a hacker's, <laughs> hacker's been thanked. Um, so the magic formula, at least for me, was first I had passion. Passion got me so far as getting myself ahead of the game. I also had a higher purpose. A large part of it for me was spiritual. But the higher purpose was looking out for others that were less fortunate. It was a higher purpose combined with the power of we, the three Ps, made an explosive combination. So my advice through all of this, uh, what the advice that I promised you is it's great to have passion, but when it gets right down to it, make a difference. It doesn't have to be through Hackers for Charity. Just do something that's going to matter. We have a powerful community. Let's leverage it. If you do decide to help with Hackers for Charity, Got a bunch of options, talked about the t-shirts and the cloud, the informer. When you leave, there are going to be business cards out at the back door. These are informer cards. What you do is you take these cards and you give them to people that you think rock. I want, the, I want to spam all the speakers at this conference that are worth anything because these cards say, your work rocks, it can save lives go to the Informer site, and we're going to make them contributors so that their stuff goes through Informer so we can make more money. That's what the cards are for. And our bulletin board system. Get online, check out our new bulletin board system. If you've got computers in Boston, go on our BBS and say, I've got computers in Boston. I want somebody else in Boston to go, I found this little charity over in Boston that needs computers. I'm going to do that thing. It's a way to enable. It's a simple little thing. There's not much to it. It's very cool. It's a way to get plugged in. So. The question that remains is, now that you're in Uganda, Africa, and you've sold everything, you've burned bridges, are you really still a hacker? <laughs> you know, and I, I guess I am, because uh, certain things make me laugh. This is, <laughs> this is part of me. Uh, so let me show you a few pictures of some things that I've seen in Uganda. I, I don't know how to explain this one. This has something to do with power over Ethernet and Viagra, <laughs> I'm, I'm guessing. Uh, this, this one made me laugh, too. This is a lock sold in Uganda. The Exploit heavy-duty lock. It's got bliss written on it. Exploit is, br is bliss. See if you guys get what made me laugh about this one. Front page, no security required. That's Microsoft product, isn't it? How, how about this one? the omnipotent power supply. And uh, I can't resist a shot like this, which I, I'm still thinking about 2600 even in Uganda. <laughs> and yes, I still shoulder surf. In fact, I can't go into a bank without taking pictures of the guy's badge and the little sign that says, make sure you lock your workstation before you get up, and pictures of the guard playing with the cell phone, and then pictures of the CSO's machine because he didn't lock his screen. Shoulder surfing. Uh, I went to Uganda Telecom to order a USB modem, and he wouldn't sell it to me until he showed me how to use it. You plug it in, you hit next 18 million times. I think he read the EULA. And I said, okay, that's great. Can I go? He says, no, I have to show you how to set it up. So he put in his username and his password. And I said, hold on, let me film. because I want to remember this when I get home. And so I filmed, and then when he did the password, I turned the camera down. It's five characters, and yes, I could surf the internet for absolutely free. 
this is where the Christian hacker part sucks. I can't <laughs> do that. Social engineering is still something I do. Um, I see these guys working on the phone system. <laughs> can't resist that. So I forget what I said, but it was something very witty and uh, social engineering thing. <laughs> and they, uh, they let me take pictures and this is their phone system. It's not like Verizon's. <laughs> And last but not least, uh, dumpster diving. I still do it, it's just a little different in Uganda. In fact, remember the Walmart and the Target and all those shops I showed you, they were all pictures of the same area, just taken from different entrances. Uh, this is the paper section, you go here for paper. Uh, let me just show you the video. Uh, you have paper No, no, from, from the bank. Yeah, yeah. It's like a drug deal gone bad. I don't know. So we have some of the paper at the booth. You'll have to come check it out. And last but not least, I still have an iPhone. It's just the, the plan is a little different. It's a scratch off and, and I can still do Google from it, which is good. And it has, it has some really addictive applications like the MTN zone, which tells you when the traffic is low, you get a discount on your cell phone usage. This is a 10% discount. Uh, sometimes it goes to 95%. <laughs> Uh, and I figured out a little loophole in, in that when it goes to 95%, if you hit the menu button, it sticks at 95% until you make your call. So I you hacked it, and uh, it's very clever, <laughs> except for the fact that I waited two hours for the 95% and didn't have to call anybody. That sort of sucked. <laughs> and uh, this last slide, which is, uh, no, this gas station is not connected to the Internet. So that's it. Yes, I'm still a hacker. Yes, I'm still here. Uh, the rumors of my demise are greatly exaggerated. And uh, don't forget the message. Make a difference. Do something. When you guys are leaving, make sure you get those cards. Spam those speakers. And I'm going to have a video up here. This is the latest Informer release. Roloff has released a Firefox plugin for Multigo, which does some incredibly sexy stuff. And Informer subscribers get it first. You don't need to hear it. It's all written up here. I'm going to play it while you guys take off. So thank you very much.